Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Board of Trustees, uh, we want to say thank you to everyone who came out tonight. I see a, a lot of smiling faces. I think that means it warmed up a little bit before you got here. Ho hopefully you enjoyed the refreshments, but we're very excited that you took the time on a Thursday evening to come out and be with us. You could have been anywhere, but you decided to be here. Whether you are a donor, researcher, student, or alumni, we welcome you. Friends of the institution, we welcome you. We're excited about what's happening at the Morehouse School of Medicine, but we are equally excited about our vision for the future. Two years ago, the board decided to invest in our school, and in doing so, we made a significant decision about our next leader, the sixth president of the Morehouse School of Medicine, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice. <clears throat> it was a really, really tough decision. It was unanimous. <laughs> and we haven't looked back. You know, when you have a jewel like the Morehouse School of Medicine, it is something you should cherish and is something that not just Atlanta and not just Georgia should appreciate. And so we are fast about the business of making sure the nation is aware of the Morehouse School of Medicine. Many of you saw the significant um, decision that was made in the office of the governor and with the legislature under the leadership of our board member, the Honorable Calvin Smyrie, the dean of the Florida legislature, where government in its infinite wisdom decided to provide the Morehouse School of Medicine with $35 million in the form of an investment. <clears throat> those kinds of decisions are not easily made, and those kinds of decisions are made because they understand the brand called MSL. They understand the value of the work that's being done by everyone who's part of the Morehouse School of Medicine family, the long hours, the sacrifices that are made. And most importantly, they understand the leadership at the helm of this great institution. Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice is a native of Georgia. She is a tremendous return on the investment by the state of Georgia, and she's come home. Ladies and gentlemen, please provide a warm welcome to Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice. Good evening. So what we saw was a medical need. It started out with a need to address access. And we've done that, and we recognize that that aligned with our mission. So 140 medically underserved counties out of 149, or 159. So how do we identify those jewels? We track every county where a student comes from. We look at who gets an interview. And then we look at, we look at who gets admitted. And we're very proud of the fact that we have 82% of our kids matriculating in 2014 from a medically underserved community in Georgia. We answered the call. We recognized in 2011 when I first started that we had been sort of flatlined at about 56 medical students. And now we've increased that. We're on our path to increase our class size in the MD program to 100 by 20. 17 and the increase in the MPH programs, as well as an increase in all of our graduate programs. It's not just about the numbers of increasing the student, what about the quality? You can see over the years, here's the minimum pass rate for a step one score. Morehouse School of Medicine students have never been near that, whether it's step one or step two. So we haven't compromised on quality as we expanded the class size. We see the same thing with our PhD program. We have an attrition rate of about 15%. Nationally, it's about 
and it's greater than 55% for African American PhDs. Our time to them uh, achieving their degree is 5.5 years. Nationally, it's six to seven years. But what we really are proud of, 100% placement. What about our MPH program? Attrition rate of 8% compared to 10%, 90% placement. So as we are expanding, we are not compromising quality. But we have to move beyond access to clinical care. And what we've done is that we've developed an integrated value-based model that has required that we have multiple partners. And we're very proud of our partners and how we participate in the market with them. Because it's not just about volume anymore. The value really is in quality. We're so proud that Morehouse Healthcare ranks number six among all Atlanta's top physician groups so people are recognizing the quality care that we provide. Now, we've increased our research also, but we've had to do it through partnership. Remember, we were founded about access, but we also knew that access would not be enough. We knew that we had to work toward the elimination of health disparities, and that required research. And so we've increased our partners with Emory, and Charles Drew and multiple others. But what it's allowed us to do is to bring in more research dollars. Many of them are continuing, meaning that they get refunded over and over again. And then we have more new awards. That's a pretty high number for a community-based academic health center. But the sustainability of our mission, you all, is really about our financial stability. So the investment that the state is willing to make in us with the $35 million says that they understand what the importance that we can bring and it's going to create sustainability for us. We've seen increases in our revenue trends, but we have a challenge. As stated, much of our revenue still comes from federal, state, and local government. That can be a challenge as you're trying to grow, particularly outside of the state of Georgia. Our expenses are really related to our research and our instruction. And we, like other organizations, spend most of our dollars on our people because that's where the success really lies. We've had multiple financial highlights, and the most important ones are for the last three years, we've had a net operating budget of about 3%, around $4 million. And we've had our balance sheet with clean audits and everything documented such that people are willing to invest in us. Now, securing our future will be through philanthropy and growth. That's what it's going to be about. And we're very proud of the fact that we've seen a steady increase in our fundraising by year. We've had key philanthropic partnerships I hope that many of you attended our groundbreaking the other day when we were able to break ground on the Billy Super Aaron Pavilion. We've had partnerships with the Coca-Cola Foundation, the Robert Wood Woodruff Foundation, Optum, and our board of trustees, our alums, and our friends. And in summary, since I assumed the role as president, we have raised $17.7 million in support of capital, scholarship, programs and endowments. Now, I'm going to clap my hand myself. <laughs> and it really has been a team sport, though. And I hope that you all are seeing how we are working toward creating exceptional stewardship to say that we value every bit of contribution that you make to us, whether it's your time or your dollars. We have much success and much to celebrate, but not without challenges. We've had losses also this year. Faculty, students, unexpected. And we think of them because we know that if they were here, they would continue in the fight for us in creating health equity. So what does the future hold? Our course will be guided by our new strategic plan, excellence through health equity. And on your way out, you will receive an executive copy of that strategic plan. 
our vision statement, leading the creation and advancement of health equity. We have three vision imperatives, translating discovery into health equity, <laughs> building bridges between health care and health, and preparing future health learners and leaders. But in order to get from vision to reality, we believe we must do three things. We must create, we must lead, and we must partner. So where will we create? We're gonna create that pipeline of learners that will have the capacity to become a health learner and leader. All of you know about the leaking pipeline. This is just an example of that using black males in 2012 between the ages of 18 and 24. And what it shows you was that 70% of those black males were living in a single parent household. And 52% of them only graduated from high school. 36% enrolled in college. So we were not surprised when we look at the fact that only 1,320 of them even applied to medical school. But we were really shocked when there was only 500 black males who entered medical school that year. And the years that have ensued, it hasn't been much better. So we know that we have to contribute way back here to that pipeline. We're gonna have more of a conversation and we're partnering with others to make it happen. I started thinking about medical school maybe around my junior year of college. I was lucky that I had two parents that are physicians. My father is a hospitalist and my mother is an oncologist. So I kind of grew up in the culture of medicine. I always had um, the feeling that I wanted to do a career that helped people. Um, and I had the example of my mother as a, as a nurse. Uh, when I was young, I thought that I needed to be something different. Um, in Tuskegee, Alabama, it's a very rural area. Um, there's a VA there, but we don't have many uh, facilities where we have access to medical care, so we would have to drive to neighboring cities, Auburn or Montgomery, to get <coughs> excuse me, medical assistance. So I didn't see many doctors. There wasn't anything to kind of prompt me to want to be a doctor, but I, I don't know, God gave me <laughs> this vision to basically you know, be a doctor. And I think it was when I got a job at Grady as a sitter where I uh, looked after uh, patients who were at risk of falling, who, you know, were uh, violent patients or just needed assistance with, you know, anything. And that was like, actually my first time being exposed to, uh, you know, the medical world, you know, just being in the hospital all the time and just seeing all these physicians make a huge difference uh, really just inspired me to, to want something better for myself. I was more of an athlete, so I really was, my route to get out of, um, out of the area where I'm from was basically sports. And like when that didn't happen, I, that's when I started to turn to college. And once I got to college, um, the athletic training program allowed me to meet like several other professions that I wasn't like, used to. And uh, after getting around some of the doctors and just understanding what they do, like that kind of got me interested into medical school. But one thing that really changed my opinion was in high school when I was deciding like what college did I want to go to and what was my major. You know, I saw the impact that my parents had on the community and the area around them. And I also really liked the change on how you would take an ordinary student or a person and train them into a highly specialized individual, you know, able to treat people. We're not all from families where somebody in the family was a doctor. So you can achieve it even if your background isn't in medicine, that it's a worthwhile thing to do. It's a fulfilling career. You help people. From a young age, I always told people that I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to be a doctor, and nobody stopped me. These stories are important. We need to share these stories to inspire our young people. And that is why we've adopted E.L. Connolly Elementary School. It is a K-5. 87% of the kids on free lunch, so it's Title I. And we've made an investment that every one of these kids will have a mentor from Morehouse School of Medicine. Yeah. 
we understand that we have to share with them what's possible. And it needs to start early so that they can learn to dream big. We've also invested in them having a STEAM Academy, Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Math. And we donated over $50,000 of equipment to outfit this lab for them. And it's really making a difference. But we've had to do it with partners. We've had partners like Georgia Power, who stepped up and has given us a grant for the last couple of years. IBM, who's sponsoring the hands-on engineering activities. The CDC and others. And we hope that you will join us in making this happen. We've also advanced our STEAM Academy in the 8th through 12, and it really has taken us having a lot of mentors. So we're looking for mentors who want to partner with us in our programs, because we know this makes a difference. When I got here in 2011, we didn't have a post back program. We started with a pilot of five students, and now we're up to 20 students. And we allow them, if they don't get into medical school the first year, they continue on to get a master's in medical science. And we have some examples of how successful that is. At Morehouse School of Medicine. I came to Morehouse, it was a post-vet program, but now it's the master's in medical science program. And I was actually invited to the program, it was an inaugural year, so I ended up coming here and staying here throughout my first year of medical school, and well, throughout medical school. Coming out of um, undergrad, I was a bio biology major, so I had an understanding of biology. However, coming into the master's in medical science program or post vet program, I actually got all the core principles that I needed for my first year in medical school that I didn't actually get from my undergraduate career. Um, what I did I learn was all the principles like anatomy, physio, um, general biochemistry, things like that, and all that was all the basis for my um, education in the first year and actually helped a lot. So coming into the post program, you're already notified that you're going to be taught how to take the MCAT, how to excel at it, and you're going to be taught all the basis and fundamentals of information that you need to take for the MCAT. In three months of the program, I actually uh, got a good grasp. So I had a scheduled MCAT. I took it, and I did uh, much better than I did the first time coming in. So Wally is now senior on our board of trustees, president of student government, going into surgery, and he's sitting here in the audience. <laughs> And we've had multiple success. Many of our students who've been in our 8 through 12 program are now in medical school. And so we're beginning to see that return on investment. So we're creating this pipeline of learners to really plug up the leaks. And it's happening in all of our programs. And we understand that we have to grow our own. GME, though, graduate medical education, is also a critical part of it. It is the part that really will determine whether or not a, a, a physician is going to practice in this area. And so we're having growth there also. And what you will see over the next three to five years, that we will have growth in every one of our programs, going from 159 to about 190 to 200 slots. We also have aspirations for future regional campuses. We know that it makes a difference where kids have their clinical exposure. And so we picked two areas, the Columbus area and the Albany area, to have our future campuses. And we're working in partnership with other institutions. This is where our third and fourth year students will have their clinical rotations. Now, how will we translate discovery into health equity? It is really going to be about looking at where those disproportionate diseases impact us. We know that cancer is one of them. We've had a long U54 uh, cancer initiative over the last 15 years, but it's time for us now to be more impactful. And so we've had patents, we've trained lots of students, we've had lots of patient visits, we've hired new oncologists, and now we are partnering because our goal is to become a cancer, Georgia Cancer Health Equity Institute by 2020. It's going to take, though, partnerships. And we know that with the right partners and all the relationships that we are developing, this is going to come to fruition. We know that it matters because when we look at, for an example, a phase one breast cancer trial, it's hard to identify sometimes the right people for those trials, the people who are going to be most impacted. And so what we've done is really strategize to figure out how do we have the greatest impact, the right patient, the right treatment at the right time. How do we get from here 
to looking at African-American females who are 50 plus years of age, who have stage three breast cancer, who are HER2 new positive, who've been previously treated with tamoxifen. You gotta have a lot of partnerships to identify those people, but you have to also have a relationship built in the community such that there is trust in order to find just that few number of people who will be eligible for the clinical trial so that you can have the right level of impact. Having a cancer center is going to allow us to do that. We've also extended our intellectual property position such that we can take patented technology and translate it into commercialization. We have several commercialization efforts with partners and overall, we to date have the largest number of ST, STTR and SBIR grants of any medical school in the state. When we think about building bridges between healthcare and health, it is really about engaging the opportunities or creating the opportunities to engage in conversations that lead to actions and solutions for patients. We have some serious issues in this country, stress, depression, substance abuse, gun violence. Some of them gain attention, some don't. But we have to be able to have the conversation that says, how do we prevent that? We do it by our Reach One, Each One program that was started by Dr. Omar Danner, a trauma surgeon at Grady, who's a faculty member at Morehouse School of Medicine. He got tired of sewing up or pronouncing dead 16, 15-year-olds. And he started to think about the peripheral impact that this was having. So he said, let's start a program where we bring kids in who are in that vulnerable age to actually see what trauma actually looks like. And that program has expanded. Or it may be that we are going to use some of our technology, like our mental health app that we've developed for clinicians and patients so they can diagnose, self-diagnose, or get reached treatment a lot faster. Now, where will we lead? We will lead in this conversation about educating and training the healthcare professionals that the nation needs. And we will not apologize for focusing on black males. And we will not compromise on our standards because we know that we can Enter students in our class who have an MCAT score here, which is one to two standard deviations below the national, and in two years, we can get them to here, where there is no difference. We do it consistently. We do it all the time. We will lead in the next generation of research, taking us beyond T1, which we think about basic science, T2, which is clinical research, T3, which is health services research, community-engaged research, and health policy. And we will lead the development of what we call TX. T is for the translational research, but X is for the exponential impact that that research must have in the outcomes of the people who can benefit. And we will also make sure that we have patient-centered coordinated care because we know that care cannot continue to just be delivered in a white room. It has to be delivered where the patient needs it. And throughout all of this, we will never step away from our core values. We added a couple of new core values, Dr. Sullivan, integrity and innovation. And the reason for that was you all, because we have to be responsive to the change in times. We've always had integrity, but we need to call it out. And we know that we will never be successful if we do not continue to innovate. Now, where will we partner? We join Orion, which is a wonderful oncology research network exchange, uh, information exchange network. We are one of the first community-based academic centers to join this network. It's going to leverage our ability to help that patient at the right time, selecting the right patient, meeting their need. We've also partnered with our Georgia other medical schools. 
because we can't solve this problem. You got 140 counties out of 159 that are underserved. Even if all of our doctors stayed in the state of Georgia, that wouldn't be enough. So we must partner together to grow our own, and we're doing that. We understand that we have to look at the Georgia high school in which a kid graduates from and understand what makes this kid competitive to eventually become this person. And we're going to partner with many of you. And so if you don't see your logo up here, it can come up here. <laughs> and we will make it so. But in all of our partnerships, we will never forget the community. And we won't go to the community and tell them what they need. We will go to the community and ask what they need in order to reach their optimal level of health. So 40 years and beyond, we're expanding our campus, if you haven't heard. 1982, 1987, 2000 was the last time we had a building. We have breaking ground on the Billy Super Aaron Pavilion. Many of you all have seen this. We're very excited about that. But we also have plans to totally renovate Hugh Gloucester 1 and 2, then to put another ME, uh, addition onto our MEB building. We then would do the third floor renovation <clears throat> of the Hugh Gloucester building. And then we will do a renovation of phase four part of our MEB building. And all of that will be important because this is how we look now, but this is how we will look in the future, in the very near future. And it's important because our students are different. They want to learn differently, and we must respond to that. This is our current most recent research lab. It has no walls. It is an opening experience for people to come in, and anybody can come in there and work with the right skill set. <laughs> now, we have challenges. Yes, we must decrease our dependency on federal funds, and we must diversify our revenue. Are we going to have some curves? Yeah, of course. We continue to navigate the unforeseen changes in NIH funding and patient care with the Affordable Care Act, but we're up for it. And then we always have to continue to leverage our value to the state to secure our state operating grant. But Representative Smyra, I think they heard us. I think they heard us. I think they heard that we are that return on investment. And by partnering with us, we can find solutions to deal with the challenges that the citizens of this great state face. We have some interesting things that we're thinking about exploring. Can we create an endowment to allow all students to attend school at no or radically less tuition? Michigan is thinking about it. They're 25% there. Can we amass enough resources to ensure that every graduate student and PhD student has, PhD student has the support they need to, exceed, to succeed? And can we have a clinical incentive plan that rewards on quality, safety, and academic success in addition to patient revenue? Imagine if every one of these counties was populated with the Morehouse School of Medicine alum. That's our goal, you all. And what you'll see in the next coming years is it won't just be a map of Georgia. It'll be a map of the United States, and it will extend to the rest of the globe. Thank you. We are leading the creation and advancement of health equity. I think Cassandra told me I needed to pause for something to come up. I'm waiting, Cassandra. <laughs> I do want to thank uh, Visitech. What do y'all think about the technology we started out with? Some of, uh, some of my colleagues who were in the audience at the uh, 
100 Most Influential Georgians, and I was fortunate enough to be selected as one. Uh, Visit Tech uh, showed that technology, and so I thought about it, and I called the guy, the, the owner up the, um, the next day, and I said, hey, I would like to use that technology in my state of the uh, school address, and he said, well, when is it? I said, oh, next week. <laughs> well, when do you need us to come down and film you? I say, in two days. And uh, so sometimes you just have to ask. But what I found out, he was born in Macon. So hey, he wanted to support his home girl. So, and thank you very much, <laughs> Visit Tech. And I don't want to uh, get into uh, acknowledging too many people because I will forget someone who is important. But I must acknowledge our founding president and dean, our president and dean emeritus, Dr. Lewis Sullivan. Would you please stand? And I think we have time for just a couple of questions. And I know my staff has some people planted with questions. Or I know that my great leadership Atlanta class mates right here, right here, right here, <laughs> will have some questions. So I really would like to take a couple of questions. OK, my questions. One of the things I would just add to your excellent presentation is the fact that Morehouse School of Medicine organized the first Neuroscience Institute at a minority institution some 14 years ago under the leadership of Dr. Peter McLeish. And with his leadership and the board that he created, as you know, some 14 additional centers have been funded by NIH at minority institutions. So I wonder if you might comment on that as well as the Cardiovascular Research Institute. All right, thank you, Dr. Sullivan. So we are celebrating our 20th anniversary of the Neuroscience Institute, and we have had multiple discoveries come out of there. And the important thing about it is, is that you all, not only are we doing great science there, but we have had a neuroscience training program for undergraduate students to be engaged. It's very competitive for the last 15 years. Our cardiovascular research institute that is headed by Dr. Herman Taylor is really on the forefront of some cutting edge research. He just got a large grant from the American Heart Association and what he's looking at is resilience. So if you and I are in the same situation, same risk factors, and you get high blood pressure, but I don't get high blood pressure. What are the factors that actually contributed to me not getting high blood pressure? And he's looking across the translational continuum, genetic factors, stress, socioeconomic factors, all of those things that we have not typically measured to really understand how we account for the resilience. Trying to figure out the, the most pressing need and the best way for members of the community to support the institution? That's a great question. So when I think about our most pressing need, it really would be to support us in really telling our story and showing the return on investment. For some people, that support will come in the form of finances. For some of it, though, it's going to be your time. For some of you, it will be you serving as an ambassador. When you are in your circle of influence and you get to tell somebody about that community-based academic health center in Atlanta, Georgia, that really does live its vision of leading the creation and advancement of health equity. And this is how they do it. They educate and train the healthcare professionals that the nation needs. They don't just work toward the elimination of health disparities. They figure out how to create and lead health equity. They understand that it's not just about volume-based care, that they actually are trying to find the right procedure or the right intervention for the patient at the right time, because they understand at the end of the day, it's about quality. Now come and join us as we lead this creation and advancement of health equity. And many of you in many roles are going to really serve as our ambassadors to do that. So that would be my greatest need. It would be my greatest need to help us tell our story 
and help us continue to demonstrate how we are that investment. Okay, I think this is it. Thank you all so much for coming out. <laughs>